everybody, and welcome to The History Effect, a series that's run by the History Council of New South Wales. My name is Dr. Kira Lindsay, and I am an Executive Councillor on the History Council of New South Wales, and I'm also a historian based at UTS, University of Technology, Sydney. I'm hosting um, a mini series, um, which we are running this year, the History Council with the Australian Centre for Public History. I hope that you can all hear me loud and clearly tonight. So the series that I'm, um, co I'm chairing tonight is known as History Now, which surprisingly, as the title suggests, is all about historical debate and conversation and history that is happening right here, right now, to quote a little bit of Fat Boy Slim. <laughs> I'm really t delighted about tonight. Um, I've been looking forward to this. I've been excited. I've been curious. I've been doing some reading, lots of thinking about the topic of, um, the, his of the statue wars and really very excited to be able to introduce three fabulous, truly fabulous speakers that we have to talk about this concept, about what about this, about the statue wars, which we might think of as generally part of the history wars, um, but perhaps even broader. Um, the cultural wars that have been going on in many parts of the world over the last 30 or so years. But before we get into our topic, I think it's entirely appropriate that we start by acknowledging the fact that the work, um, the History Council is based, um, is based on Gadigal country, which is the country um, in Sydney around the harbour, around the waters, around Wawrang. Um, and in fact, our offices sit within the Police and Justice Museum, which is right on Circular Quay. So we acknowledge the Gadigal people, the traditional owners, the ongoing custodians of that country and pay our respects. I would also like to pay my respects for the Vigigal people on whose country I am working tonight around the Botany Bay region. Botany Bay kind of being present in this conversation tonight because of the cap of statues of Captain Cook, which I suspect are gonna come up in our conversation this evening. Acknowledgements, flags, place names, museum practices, national anniversaries, all of these things have been flashpoints over the last 20, 30, even 40 years. And for many people, in fact, much, much longer. But this year, the most recent object to be swept up in this tug of war about how we think about ourselves as a society is to quote one of our speakers, Jess Moody, the lumps of stone and metal that stand silently in our towns and cities. Somehow these statues that were erected mostly in the late 19th century have acquired a very different significance than that which was probably originally intended. For some people, they are part of the part past and reminders of our national accomplishment. For others, they are reminders that the past is not past, it's not over. And in fact, they function as markers in the landscape that celebrate colonialism and imperialism, that silence the stories of suffering, they convey colonialism, they, I'm sorry, they convey a power to menace and normalize injustice in ways that make it harder to demand accountability and so that we can achieve injustice. In fact, there's been a lot written on this topic and I think we're going to get a chance to survey that in our discussion today. So what should we do? Should we have more statues, no statues, statues with bits that explain them or statue parks? Where do statues go to die when we as a people declare them dead? The novelist Amit Shachuri in a 2018 article in The Guardian said, why and when does it become possible to ignore or laugh at statues? And when does it become impossible to do so? The stakes are high right now for us, as we know. The violence around the protests and the police guards attest to this fact. Phrases like self-hating, relaxed or comfortable, denial, truth-telling, trauma, is all going on. And in this year of a pandemic lockdown, suddenly we are having this tussle about history in our public spheres, thanks to the Black Lives Matters protests. So why has this been effective when, as we know in many cases, people have been arguing for more than 20 years to have these statues removed because they are so distressing? These are some of the questions that our speakers are going to talk about tonight. And I hope that in so doing, we also raise the 
um, questions of what is the role of the historian in this process? How can we work with communities and the public? Um, and also, what does it mean to be doing good history for us? Those, most of those statues were under the influence of Tom, Thomas Carlyle's, Carlyle's notion of the great men of history. History is a biography made of these great men, but we don't think that anymore. We think of history as having to do different things, as having to heal, as having to truth tell, of having to bring difficult knowledges to the surface for acknowledgement. So what do we need? What is our good history? Who's doing it already? How can we acknowledge that and how can we build on it? That's what I think we're going to be talking about tonight. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Each of our speakers will tend to talk for about 10 to 15 minutes and there'll be opportunities for questions after each um, talk. And you can stream those in the chat and I'll do my best to facilitate those and ask them. We'll, go, we'll start with um, Nathan and move through the speakers. And then at the end, we'll open the forum for a little bit of discussion before finishing perhaps a little bit after seven o'clock. So our three speakers tonight, Nathan Madjai Sentence, a Wiradjuri man and project officer at the Australian Museum. Dr. Jess Moody, University of Bristol, a lecturer in public history, and Claire Baxter, who has a master's in conflict in archeology span and heritage. Our first speaker, Nathan Maji Sentence, is a Wiradjuri man from the Maugi clan who, drew, who grew up on Darkenji country in New South Wales. Nathan works to ensure that First Nations stories are being such as galleries and libraries, archives and museums, and are being told and controlled by First Nation people. He also has a fantastic series of blogs known as the Archivist Decolonist. And if you haven't seen them already, I really encourage you to go and have a look at those. And so with no further ado, I hand you over to Nathan. Thank you. You're a moral Nindubi, Nathan Sanchi Wanadi, Waraji Giri Baudo, Yinda Maleja, Nanawa, Nurumbangu, in the Malaysia Narawa Mujigangu, in the Malaysia Nari Mujigangu. Um, before I begin, I too would like to acknowledge that I am currently on the unceded lands of the Nanawa people, and I want to pay my respects to their elders past and present, and want to state that I will try to the best of my abilities to be respectful of their country while I'm here. Um, and I'd also like to recognize the First Nation lands that everyone may be tuned in from, and that whose land this is is an important question in tonight's discussion as many colonial um, monuments, especially in these lands, are occupying space on stolen land. Um, my name is Nathan um, Muji Sentence. Um, yeah, as uh, Kira said, I'm a Wiradjuri man, family from Mudgee, New South Wales, but I grew up on Darkenjung country. I'm actually not a historian, I'm more of a history communicator. I'm a librarian actually by trade, but I've worked in sort of museums, archives and libraries um, that sector for over a decade. I currently work at the Australian Museum as a First Nations public programmer, and I work at the University of Sydney, both on Gadigal country. And, um, and I'd like to say that during this talk, the, my views for in this are my own and do not reflect either of my employers. Um, in saying that, uh, part of the work me and of many First Nations people in museums and libraries engage in is often about getting visitors to these member institutions um, to interrogate public memory, um, to get them to consider in regards to history, what stories do they hear? Who tells these stories? What stories and more importantly, whose voices are missing or disregarded? Whose voices and what stories are being privileged over them and why? Hopefully this gets visitors to be constructively critical about public memory, but also to see how, thing, how whiteness and the patriarchy can um, inform muse what museums preserve and also how exhibitions are constructed and perceived. Um, and this part of this is also trying to get visitors to engage with brutal histories and uncomfortable facts and getting them to understand that those past injustices are connected to the injustices of now and that they do not live outside of history rather in the legacy of it. And that we need to reckon with this brutal history so we can better understand the present and change it to be more just. However, this is often difficult. Um, for example, I was recently involved in a museum program for university students where we discussed um, the stolen generations uh, and intergenerational trauma uh, 
And after the program, a few students um, anonymously commented on their feedback forms that they felt like they were being reprimanded and made to feel bad for being white, um, which I found to be an odd response because we never assigned to blame. We were just discussing a reality, an issue that affects many, many First Nations people. Um, but uh, some of these students chose to disengage because what we were talking about made them feel uncomfortable. And I think this is ever present in discussions around colonial statues. There's often a defensiveness. Um, people feel the need to defend these statues, uh, feel the need to defend inanimate objects, um, which I believe has less to do with history and more to do with an avoidance of the uncomfortable aspects of history. And I just witnessed this in the last week when a Newcastle councillor said he wanted to remove this plaque uh, he was going to put a motion up to remove it because it was historically inaccurate. And this was met with a tad bit of social media outrage, um, many stating the removing of this is erasing history, um, not connecting or deliberately dismissing how this plaque itself is erasing history. How stating James Cook discovered the east coast of these lands, the plaque and the monument disregard the 60,000 plus years of history, especially a wobble history in Newcastle. Um, or how the celebration of this event and this man hides the pain that they've caused um, and still cause and obfuscates the ongoing justice that stem from this event. Or how often these um, monuments are part of, of privileging certain types of individuals while excluding many, omitting many people, especially First Nations women, from the approved national narrative. Um, and I feel like um, with this many people aren't really defending history. They're sort of, um, a lot of people will say that these sort of discussions are very ideological driven, but I feel like in these cases, they're not defending history and they're really just defending an ideology. This is why many people even have trouble articulating why, you know, certain anniversaries or statues are important. For example, um, former national, um, nationals um, deputy leader, Bridget McKenzie, in attempting to explain why the country celebrates Australia Day on Jan 26, said it was because Jan 26 was the day James Cook came to these shores um, when the actual date was April 29. And similarly, um, people will tell me that we need to protect statues of James Cook because he was a great man, but they can't, they can't tell me anything about James Cook besides the fact that he came to Australia on a ship called the Endeavour. Um, and another argument against the removal of statues is often uh, the, the, these statues can help tell the dark side of this country and the dark history of men like Cook, um, Macquarie and Brisbane. But, uh, you know, as people say, you can't change history, but you can learn from it. However, for all the statues and things named after Governor Macquarie, um, very few people um, are aware of his involvement in things like the Appen Massacre. Um, Colonial statues rarely do anything but glorify colonial figures and their actions, which include, you know, the genocide of First Nations people. Uh, they have limited capacity for nuance in many cases. And additionally, like the argument that um, well, we can use these statues to um, tell dark histories or, you know, uh, I feel like this hides why they were built in the first place. Um, they were not built to be conversation starters or to be cautionary tales of white supremacy. In fact, they do the opposite. They're, they're built to uh, solicit admiration, um, to celebrate colonization and colonizers in spite of the suffering we First Nations people have experienced and continue to experience. Um, and many people defend statues, um, I believe, because they do not want to admit the reality that Australia is built on injustice and potentially their own complicity, in complicity, uh, complicity with this injustice. Um, reckoning this can tarnish the white Australian self-image of uh, innocence and bring up feelings of guilt. And of course, we do not want to feel guilt. It's uncomfortable, but avoiding truth and defending certain narratives to avoid it is, in my opinion, the antithesis of um, what history should achieve. Um, and, you know, there's that old saying that those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Uh, nevertheless, there are many um, non-Indigenous Australians who do not want to learn from history because uh, they do not want the guilt associated with that knowledge. As I was saying, I don't really believe that colonial statues do anything rather than um, glorify colonial figures and their actions.
um, which include the genocide of First Nations people. Um, and they have limited capacity for nuance in many cases. And I feel like um, a lot of people try to defend statues by sort of, uh, you know, saying that, um, you know, we can't change history, but we can tell, we can tell it all. And, but I feel like this, that hides why statues were made, look, or many of these statues were made in the first place. Um, and they weren't made to be uh, conversation starters or cautionary tales of white supremacy. In fact, they do the opposite. And they were kind of built for solicit admiration to celebrate colonization and colonizers in spite of the suffering we First Nations people have experienced and continue to experience. Um, many people like defend statues um, because they don't really want to admit the reality that Australia is built on injustice and potentially their own um, complicity in this injustice. And I think reckoning with this can tarnish um, white Australia's self image of innocence and bring up feelings of guilt. And of course, you know, we don't want to feel guilt. Um, and yeah, there's that old saying, uh, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Nevertheless, I don't think many people want to learn from history um, uh, because they do not want the guilt to associate with it. And also there's many people who benefit from history repeating itself. So they want that to continue. They do not want to learn from history um, because they do want history to keep repeating. And they also um, actively want to prevent others from learning from it too. And um, both these positions prevent um, the actions needed to rectify historical and contemporary injustices faced by First Nations people. The defense of statues also begs the question of what <coughs> of we, do we as a society value? What do we think needs to be protected and preserved? Um, just as the conversation of public monuments got um, reignited, um, Rio Tinto destroyed um, a 46,000 um, year old cultural site in Western Australia um, near the Jockin Gorge. Um, and many commentators, especially in the media space, who jumped into the fence of statues of Cook were silent when it came to being outraged when this happened, um, which makes their apparent motivation of defending history feel hollow when this site and many sites like it contain so much more heritage and knowledge than any statue of Cook would ever be capable of. Similarly, this slide, um, I got this from Get Up Australia, um, Again, sites like this rarely get a mention in these types of discussions. And these are sites of history and sites of um, knowledge, um, place things, you know, um, uh, holders of knowledge that we can learn from. And uh, the fact that a lot of them are being destroyed is examples are actually history being erased every day. And um, of course, uh, the images like this were ubiquitous a few weeks ago. These photos were taken during a small Black Lives Matter demonstration in Sydney, Gadigal country. Uh, and the police, um, they're surrounding a statue of Cook and Hyde, the statue of Cook and Hyde Park. And um, during all my life, I've never seen this type of police presence at a First Nations sacred site. Going back to what I was previously saying about those other, with those other slides, unless they were there to forcibly stop and arrest traditional custodians trying to protect their land from mining or logging. And again, this is a time where we're shouting Black Lives Matter. And in response, the state tells us that statues need protecting. Um, in response to this, I think it's important to ask the questions of what matters to us. And for me, um, community matters, um, not just individuals. And for me, what matters is actions based on values rather than symbols or figures that we think embody them. Um, and that leads to like, what's next? What to do with an empty plinth? Um, I think it's a great opportunity to uh, create space for more truth telling about this country, um, to figure out how we got here, uh, how um, talking about different structures, different systems that have come from sort of uh, this legacy of invasion and what does that legacy mean? So having an opportunity for truth telling, but at the same time also um, restoring um, places, learning from country. Again, um, there's lots of sites that need protecting and also a lot of um, monuments, uh, as I said at the start, are occupying stolen land. It would be great to have more opportunities to learn about that stolen land, to learn about the people who um, have um, a millennia of connection to that country and, um, and in ways that may not be just monuments, in ways that we can uh, look to country to learn from, to learn about history, to look at place to learn about history without uh, 
the need of statues. And also, um, this is more to do if after we remove statues, I think we need to convert action into more action. Um, uh, I think we need to dismantle the systems that these statues represent rather than just the statues themselves. I think um, I know a lot of commentators have been making this commentary whereas, whereas um, you know, Black Lives Matter uh, especially have come in, has entered in lots of different conversations and, you know, there's lots of things talking about representation and film and uh, statues, but at the end of the day, it, the, the Black Lives Matter movement was really talking about, especially in Australia, was talking about the, crim the criminal punishment system and what we need to do to rectify that. I think, um, and as uh, statues, I think a lot of colonial statues can be um, symbols of injustice. And I think removing them can be uh, symbolically saying that we want to step towards justice, but it needs more right after that. It can't just be, uh, the, the removal of the statue in and of itself is not the goal. The goal is to make a more just society. I think this is, uh, and this was sort of one of the first steps that we can do. Um, so I'm gonna finish on this quote by um, uh, Ruben Rose uh, Redwood and Will Patrick. I think it's really good, uh, you know, and um, whether um, you know, colonial statues must fall or remain is not a matter of history alone. It is part of a process of the um, reckoning of the ongoing injustices and state of colonialism in the present. And I think that's um, very much uh, what this is about. I think it's um, reckoning, reckoning with settler colonialism and all how and all the ways it manifests. Um, so Mandan Guru, thank you. Thank you, Nathan. That was just fantastic. And that was just such an interesting talk. And um, you raised the idea of brutal histories, non-celebratory histories, histories needing to be not nuanced, but also the fact that we need to somehow, sometimes people don't want to learn their histories. And so I wanted to ask about the work that you do as a curator who is also trained as a librarian. How do you encourage people to want to learn from history? What are some examples also that you think have been really effective? Um, I've been for a very long time been trying to um, grapple with this. Uh, I often um, want to, I uh, think even in a lot of our exhibitions, uh, especially ones that deal with specifically like colonization and invasion, um, we've been trying to um, be truthful to ourselves, be truthful to the content, but at the same time, we are aware that this stuff can be confronting to visitors. So we have to figure out how we um, get people to engage. It's, it's a fine line because we do not want to ever be dishonest or um, soften our approach to the point that um, what we were aiming to achieve was pointless. But at the same time, um, you know, we also want people to actually engage with it in the first place. Um, We've done a few things in the past that we haven't uh, done for a while where we, we've done previously lots of tours that have, um, uh, we used to do a tour called Indigihack, uh, uh, where we sort of um, looked at um, older galleries uh, and sort of talked about um, getting um, visitors to actually question um, their biases or getting them to sort of see how uh, exhibitions have been curated to see how like uh, we used to do this thing at one of the exhibitions had um, lots of uh, material on display and we asked them um, from around the world and we asked them, we asked uh, tour participants, we'd go, uh, go out and um, find us something that you believe relates to um, women culture or like culture relating to women and um, come back and like tell the group about what you learnt and we can share this information. But it was kind of a trick because out of the 200 objects um, that were on display in this particular exhibition, there was only about six that related to women. Um, mm -hmm. So again, we can sort of uh, use that to sort of show like the bias in exhibitions. And then we can use it to talk about previous, uh, like a lot of times um, I've been involved in, um, and I specifically because I think it's interesting to me, was um, critical self-reflection of um, the institutions that we've worked in. And I can sort of use it to sort of talk about and then broaden that to connecting it to history. Um, like uh, 
we uh, recently, you know, we would uh, do tours where we talk about, again, similarly, like um, the Australian Museum's collection, uh, even though it's got a large First Nations collection, that some of that collection is basically built on anthropologists and their perceptions have really shaped our understanding of First Nations people, but also shaped our collection. Um, if you were to look at the First Nations collection at the Australian Museum, without even any interpretation, you'd think that Aboriginal people were, we were warlike and we were heavily man-focused because that's predominantly what's in our collection is weaponry and male objects. And so with, even without interpretation, there's been an interpretation created by how our collection has been made. Um, so yeah, critical self-reflection and sort of, um, and yeah, and, and always trying to, because people, there are a lot of people that are willing to hear about, uh, or especially school children and school groups that want to learn about past injustices. Um, but I'm always trying to connect past injustices today. So like, you know, previously I would do this tour where I talk about, we have a, uh, thing at the Australian Museum that talks about the stolen generations and I always talk about when we talk about the stolen generations I always talk about you know um, the fact that more children are taken today than um, during the, um, the period of the stolen generation and things like the New South Wales Adoption Act that came out in 2018 which um, very much um, is very similar to some of the um, practices of um, what was happening during the stolen generation and then and at the same time, yeah, uh, just trying to get people to think about those connections and even like language usage, like previous and now, and like sometimes the language has changed, but the effect is still the same, but also too, just to be um, wary of that language, like like um, a lot of people can see how the stolen generations is bad, but at the time they weren't calling the stolen gener they weren't being called the stolen generations, it was being called protection policies, mm -hmm. which is very similar to sort of the stuff that's being said now especially in the language around, say, like the New South Wales Adoption Act. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I read today a, um, a 2018 article by Tyler Steam in The Guardian, and, and um, he was talking about the blindness of the everyday that we have and how over the last 30 years or so, people have been increasingly required to um, dissolve that everyday blindness and to see things as they really are. And I guess I, I kind of wanted to ask you, why now? Why do you think that, uh, we know that there have been protest moments that started in 2015 in Cape Town when um, someone basically threw a bucket of shit, use my language, excuse my language, onto a, a statue of Cecil Road. And that since then, you know, we've seen these moments, but why now? Why 2020? I think it's a matter of why now. It's just like it hasn't happened yet. Um, mm. Like uh, mob have been fighting for similar things for a very long time. Um, fighting for, um, you know, uh, it's just, I think it's just um, the willingness of like media is engaging with it. Um, but, you know, like previously, like in 1988, uh, uh, because of the reenactment of the first fleet coming in and they were um, hiring, um, they were trying to have like a meeting of the first fleet and uh, a local Aboriginal group. Yeah. Uh, that that well, largely process, it was the largest protest since the Vietnam War uh, protest. So um, what we've been, and then similarly in 1938, the day of mourning was in response to the 150th anniversary of the first fleet. And again, they, um, I think, there's been throughout years, I think there's been um, arguments for against sort of the symbols of injustice uh, or manifestations of injustice. I think it's um, depending on uh, when people will listen. I think um, one of the, uh, there's lots of like valid critiques of say social media, but one of the best things about it is that um, a lot of mob that uh, don't that you formerly had to go through gatekeepers to get their voice heard in some situations now don't like there's uh, uh, Aboriginal people. We can be very active on social media and say that we don't like this um, or say that, um, and people can find, um, hear us and then say, well, I've never thought of that before. Like, uh, again, like, as you're saying, it's quite invisible. Like, um, you know, people will walk past uh, cook in Hyde Park every day and never think about it. Um, but, I can tell you that uh, like a lot of my colleagues at the Australian Museum, First Nations colleagues, will say that it bothers them to walk past every day. Yeah. It's just that um, uh, 
we, you know, you've got to be mindful who you tell that and who will listen. Yeah. Yeah, so this kind of um, history practice that we're, has been provoked by the statue wars is inviting us to be more considerate and empathetic to try and stand in other people's shoes. And yet, nothing has really happened in Australia yet, has it? You know, we haven't pulled down any statues. We're, a few have been vandalised. So we're still yet to see the change that people have been calling for. Yeah, yeah. We've got a few questions that have come through also. Um, sorry, Nathan, I cut across you then. You were going to respond to that? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm happy to hear these questions. Yeah, well, a question just about, uh, quite a few questions have come through about teaching um, and students and, um, you know, what can be done about um, greater exposure um, of First Nations histories in the school curricula? Yeah, I think um, it's one of the questions I get a lot at the museum. Um, a lot of, a lot of, there's a lot of um, well-intentioned teachers who um, keep asking me very, the very similar question of like, we'd love to talk about this stuff, but we don't know how. Um, but I think there's ways you can talk about it. I think, uh, I think guidelines are coming out, you know, talk, you know int inviting uh, local elders into your school. Um, you know, budging so local elders can come into your school and talk about your local area. Um, but I think, yeah, I think a lot of this, I just think start talking about it, start having conversations about this, uh, about um, this sort of history and how, it, again, how it connects to today, how um, that these, a lot of these things that we think are past injustices have continued, they've just changed the form of what they look like. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I think, uh, and also to um, don't uh, underestimate or fear uh, how children respond to this. I think a lot of times, um, one other thing too, is I think sometimes people get fearful and I, I, I do believe that we should, you know, you know, be mindful of uh, how brutal this sort of stuff can be. But at the same time, I think, um, a lot of times kids are willing to engage in this history. Um, and a lot of times um, in previous um, situations, sometimes I've had where the children are much more open-minded than say their teachers into learning this sort of history and learning these sort of things. Mm. Thanks for that. I think that's um, really true. And I, I guess another thing to do would might, might be to invite students to think about what kind of guidelines they might set around the establishment of a statue today. You know, what would you do if you wanted to build a statue right now? If we decide that we're going to create counter statues or completely new statues, what would be the terms? What, what would you use? What would be the value system for venerating somebody or a collective or an issue? And, and what place do um, memorials of trauma and grieving also have? potentially as statues to ask those questions. What do we want to remember? Not just who do we want to remember? Yeah, I think that's uh, important. I think, yeah, that that's a, an exercise that's always interesting is they get people, um, get students to look at, especially older students to look at space and think about how they would make space to be more um, inclusive. Uh, and this could be in many different factors, how you'd make space more inclusive. But I know that there is uh, there are lots of, um, at, at your university, UTS, they do a lot of decolonizing design. And um, mm -hmm. some of those students, um, in response to seeing the Macquarie statue, sort of um, sort of draped Aboriginal flags over it as their sort of like little project. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, um, I think there is cool ways you can sort of look at space and also look at um, what, yeah, what uh, do you want to achieve? And like thinking about, again, like values, like uh, how do you, do we need, do we really need um, individuals to embody our um, supposed values? Do we, can we um, have, can we just be, create no value by being better community members? Like do we need um, statue reminders of things like that. Mm, fantastic. Thanks, Nathan. Well, we'll come back to you at the end, I think, but it's time to move on to Jess now. Jess, Le senior lecturer in public history at the University in Bristol, specialising in memory, public history, um, specifically in difficult and dissonant pasts, 
Your monograph is coming out this year on Liverpool as a um, remembering slavery in Liverpool, slavery capital of the world um, in Europe. So over to you, Jess. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen. So on June the 7th, during a Black Lives Matter protest in the centre of Bristol, activists pulled down the statue of slave trader Edward Colston, which had stood on that spot since 1895. The protesters cheered, climbing the plinth and giving the Black Power salute from where the statue once looked over inner city Bristol. One protester knelt on its neck for eight minutes, symbolically replicating the police action which had killed African-American man George Floyd on May 25th, his killing having ignited the Black Lives Matter protests around the world. The plaque on the side of the statue's plinth had originally said only this about the statue and Edward Colston, quote, erected by citizens of Bristol as a memorial of one of the most virtuous and wise sons of their city, AD 1895. During the protest, this was edited to read instead that the citizens of Bristol rejected Edward Colston. The protesters then rolled the heavy statue around the waterfront and dumped it into Bristol Harbour by Parrow's Bridge, a bridge commemoratively named after an enslaved man living in Bristol in the 18th century. This historic event marked the first time a monument to a slave trader was pulled down or otherwise removed in Britain. This dramatic and momentous occasion, however, did not come out of nowhere. There has been a long history of challenge to this statue, as well as the numerous other buildings, streets, institutions, and ceremonies designed to celebrate Edward Colston in the city. This challenge has been particularly clearly pronounced since the 1980s, following riots and resistance to racism, police brutality, and institutionally racist practice that took place across a number of British cities. Much of this, uh, the activities in the 1990s surrounding slavery and memory in Britain were partly prompted by the riots of the 1980s and focused on projects aimed at facing up to the past as a way of encouraging racial healing in fractured multicultural cities. Many people, therefore, have been actively critical of the statue of Colston for at least the last 30 years. Grassroots campaigning group Countering Colston have sought to challenge the celebration of Edward Colston across the city through protests and campaigns, through their website, but also through public history work like walking tours of the city. It's not just the statue that celebrated Colston. Countering Colston have highlighted and consistently challenged the broader cult of Colston, as they call it, in the city, seen through the naming of several local schools, street and pub names, building names, the celebration of Colston through commemorative stained glass windows in the cathedral, and through religious ceremonies long acted out around Colston's birthday, on Colston Day on November the 13th every year, where a procession would lead from the statue to his burial crypt. At this ceremony, there was even a Colston bun, a type of fruitcake given to the children who took part, and girls attending Colston Girls School wore bronze chrysanthemums, his favourite flower, for their annual commemoration ceremony. So who was Edward Colston and why has the city of Bristol celebrated him so much? Born in Bristol in 1636, Edward Colston joined the Royal African Company in 1680, which at the time held a monopoly over the British slave trade and was responsible for the enslavement of over 84,000 African people who were taken to the Americas by British ships. 19,000 of these died on the Middle Passage. Even after withdrawing from the Royal African Company in 1692, Colston continued to slave trade privately, retiring in 1708. He was also a Tory MP for Bristol, representing the city, and a prominent member of the Society of Merchant Venturers. The Society of Merchant Venturers, an unelected group of Bristol elites, which still exists and exerts power in Bristol today, date back to the 13th century. They have a strong colonial history, 
They funded the 15th century voyage of John Cabot to Canada and traded in enslaved African people from 1689, lobbying the British Parliament to open this up beyond the monopoly of the Royal African Company. Colston made some charitable donations to local causes, especially the establishments of boys and girls schools. Uh, the the, the boy, boy schools also served as a useful place to drum up sailors for his ships. And more bequests followed his death in 1721. Though a lot of the claims to his great philanthropy do seem to be over-exaggerated and poorly supported. The Society of Merchant Venturers have been influential in promoting the celebration of Edward Colston in the city as one of their greatest members, a membership which has been very white and male for almost all of its existence. So why has the city of Bristol celebrated him so much? This really is the key question when it comes to historically contextualizing the statue and the public memory of Edward Colston in Bristol. Why was so much named after him? Why were these weird rituals and ceremonies instigated and carried out for so long? And why was a statue erected of him in 1895, some 120 years after his death? In many ways, the cult of Colston, which gathered pace in the late 19th century, wasn't all that much about Edward Colston at all. As Bristol historian Madge Dresser has shown, when the statue was constructed in 1895, this memorial cult of Colston, orchestrated by the city powers, and here especially the merchant venturers, was a late Victorian memory cult intent on foregrounding good Christian moral values through the celebration of a civic hero to buttress civic pride, to boost provincial Bristol's identity and sense of self in the age of the invention of tradition, as E.P. Thompson has referred to the era. Moreover, the city authorities in Bristol chose a figure who they framed as a good Christian philanthropist, a wealthy merchant father of Bristol, a patriarchal and paternal figure of charity for Bristol citizens to look up to. This figure was particularly aimed at the urban poor of the city, who between 1889 and 1890 led large-scale protests and strikes over living and working conditions in the city. As Bristol PhD student James Watts puts it, quote, the erection of the Colston statue can be seen as an attempt to reassert paternalism in the face of anxiety over working class unrest. The narrative of Colston as a patriarchal philanthropic father of the city has been fed into school education, political discourse, as well as the fabric of the city. Streets were renamed after him. 20th century concrete office blocks, which bore no historical links to Colston, had his name emblazoned on their towers. The citizens of Bristol, black and white, were for over a hundred years taught that they should love this man, find pride in him as an emblem of their city, and consider Colston a key part of the heritage of Bristol. However, challenges and protests to the statue are also part of this heritage. Activism and artistic interventions with the statue have long been a focal point for what Alan Rice has called guerrilla memorialization, unofficial acts of engagement and interaction which challenge the public narratives of this statue. The statue has been graffitied, had unofficial alternative plaques added to it, it's been yarn bombed with knitted chains, and the image on the right was an installation added by modern anti-slavery charity called Here and Now in 2018. To carry on this heritage, after the statue came down, a number of other figures have gone up in its place. There was a figure of a bald man in a rubbish bin with the words, spoiler, St. George was Turkish, a mannequin of British TV personality and now renowned paedophile Jimmy Savile with a placard criticizing the BBC, and most recently, a statue of Black Lives Matter protester Jen Reed by London artist Mark Quinn in the pose she took when the statue came down. Whilst powerful in its imagery of black female agency, this latest intervention called a surge of power 
has also been criticised for being the work of a white artist from London, using this platform for himself, where many hoped that the work of local black artists could instead be supported. The sculpture was removed by Bristol City Council within 24 hours of it going up and is being held by the museum service. There will no doubt be many more interventions and one suggestion has been to use the existing plinth as a place for many interventions, revolving temporary artworks by local artists. Other suggestions have included statues of notable black figures, such as Paul Stevenson, who organised the Bristol bus boycott in 1963 in protest over Bristol Omnibus's company's refusal to employ black or Asian people. Bristol-born street artist Banksy suggested that a new sculpture depicting the statue being pulled down should be put in the empty spot. Many people, including figures of government, have criticised the protesters for an act of vandalism by pulling the statue down. And whilst many people in Bristol generally agreed that there probably shouldn't be a statue celebrating a slave trader in the middle of their city in the 21st century, they thought the protesters should have gone through the proper channels. <laughs> well, the proper channels have repeatedly failed over the years. Groups have been calling for its removal tirelessly with no effect. In the last few years, the City Council have been working with a group of historians and local activists on an additional alternative plaque to put on the statue's plinth, next to the one that says nothing of where Colston got his wealth. There was great debate about the wording of this plaque. The Society for Merchant Venturers, them again, wanted to tone down the language and information added about the extent of his slave trading activities changes which others felt would be an unacceptable sanitization of the past. So even the addition of a contextual plaque, which to be fair, would have been quite literally the least that could have been done while still actually doing something, failed due to the unequal politics of power in the city. As many historians, such as David Olasoga and Oliver Totele, have been at pains to stress Pulling these statues down does not erase history, it creates it. One of the questions for this panel was about what historians can do. I think we can play a part in remembering both why these statues went up and why they came down. These statues are symbols in our public spaces. We should not forget how and why they were put up in the first place. We should tell these histories because of what they reveal about public sculpture, monuments and statues as part of the architecture of white supremacy, as in the case of Confederate monuments erected during Jim Crow, or the celebration of imperial might and heroes of empire, as with figures of Cecil Rhodes in Oxford or King Leopold in Belgium, or alongside these contexts, sometimes as a mechanism of building a mythology about a city's past, as a way to create philanthropic heroes, constructed and celebrated to inspire civic pride and keep the masses in their place. To tell the histories of these monuments in their messy, complex, sometimes contradictory nature is to destabilize their assumed place as heritage. The discourse of heritage is doing a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of knee-jerk reactions to keep statues of slave traders and racists on their pedestals. The discourse of heritage, as Laura Jane Smith has argued, especially in Britain and the West, is a conservative discourse which privileges old material culture as being inherently valuable in and of itself. An idea which gained traction particularly strongly from the 19th century onwards, when a lot of these monuments were going up. And it has worked hard to construct racialized ideas of a so-called shared heritage, that the buildings, statues, lavish country houses and castles of a country like Britain are our heritage. We should all feel a shared sense of ownership and inheritance for the nation state through them. By telling their history, we show that statues are memory, not history. They don't represent well, they don't even re represent the past they're apparently depicting. They reveal instead the attitudes, anxieties, and context of the times in which they were created. Importantly, we should also not forget the circumstances in which these monuments are coming down in the present. As much as they represent the context of their times when they went up, they also embody the context of the present when they came down. <laughs> 
These monuments were pulled down by the collective action of activists and protesters in the name of the Black Lives Matter campaign. In the name of confronting and calling out racial violence against black people and institutionalized racism around the world. Too much, I think, of the public debate around what has been done or what should be done with the statues of white supremacists, slave traders and imperialists has decentered the Black Lives Matter movement. Much of the media, and I think here, especially the right wing press, have instead engaged in an often abstract debate about what to do with all sta statues in general, often lamenting about the loss of monuments no one has raised any issue with or cares about as the logical end of all of this erasing of history. So I think there is a danger here that debating about statues and what to do with them can be used by some people as a way of sidelining the issues raised by the Black Lives Matter protests and distracting calls away from racial justice in the present. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Jess. Fantastic. It seems to me that one of the things that you and Nathan have both said there is that one of the things that historians can do in working with community and the public is to remind us that this debate, this conversation, this series of actions around statues, as relevant as they may be, may also potentially distract us from those much more important issues. Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, in a way, taking down the statues is the easy bit. It, you know, it might not seem like it, but the real, the sort of real work that is the urgent pressure behind this action happening at all is about calling out racial injustice in the present. Um, you could rename all of the streets of Colston around Bristol and, and Bristol would still be the most segregated city, uh, racially segregated city in, in the UK, which it is. Um, so I, I think sometimes there's a sort of tendency, and I think this kind of relates to what Nathan was saying as well about um, there are ways of distracting through this debate as well of sort of having caring more about the statues than you do about the issues that are being raised um so i think that's that's a sort of imperative point and it's about i guess as historians we're, we we're about context you know that's the thing that that we that we mm. we do <laughs> and mm. so I think keeping that pressure on saying, okay, so the statues, they are symbolism of um, a celebration of colonialism, of imperialism, of white supremacy, um, but they're coming down in this, this really important uh, moment of pressure around recognizing a present day issue. So yeah, bringing it back to the present is, is something that I think we, we can keep doing. Yeah, and, and you seem to be saying quite emphatically that in contrast to, contrary to the argument that pulling down the statues is erasing history, mm -hmm. that one, the statues really can't be conceived usefully as history in the first place, and that second, in fact, pulling them down is an act of history that needs to be contextualised and, and nuanced and considered. Absolutely, yes, and, and sort of pulling them down... I, I know we've had a few questions about teaching and and um, and sort of uh, students and, and young people and I, and this is a teachable moment and I think that's the thing that's really exciting about this is that um, this is both creating history and teaching a moment in which this is providing a, a wealth of material through which we can discuss and engage and and get to these kinds of issues. Um, and this is this is a historical moment in and of itself. It's hard sometimes to think about it like that. But and you know, historians, future historians will have have uh, a lot of work on their hands for 2020. You know, you think about what <laughs> month you're going to specialise in 2020. As we do right but, now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. But I think so. So take the Edward Colston statue. You know, so what I really hope is that that statue will be able to go into uh, Bristol's Social History Museum, the M Shed, and that that can then be a space for you know, a really interesting, engaging exhibition about, first of all, who Edward Colston was, but then a focus on why on earth this slightly mad memorial cult was created about him in the 19th century, mm -hmm. um, how that was sort of infiltrated through Bristol's public discourse over the next sort of 120 years. Uh, and then and then the history of how it came down as an act of um, collective political action. And so and so have that as a I think that would be um, a really excellent exhibition as well. Yeah, it, be, it would become a, a really powerful way of reflecting on the question of who 
makes history and how does a public decide what is good history for itself right now? You know, mm. and your, your example of reading what's happening at the moment is an example of good history. Would you say that the moment of pulling down that statue was a moment of um, good history as well? Ooh. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's an interesting question. It's very loaded, isn't it? Perhaps you'd like to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, hard. it's sort of a bit of a... I don't really want yeah I don't really want to categorize kind of good and bad I mean it, it happens and 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 I think what we can do is we can explain why it happened and we mm -hmm. can say it wasn't a sort of you know spur of the moment um group mentality issue that just happened on the 7th of June 2020 mm. this is this has been going on for a really long time mm. you know it didn't come out of nowhere people have been building to this moment um so I think that in terms of collective action, it tells a really important uh, story, and it can tell it tells a really important story in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement as well as being. And it this and it was an important movement because it it then inspired the consideration of uh, in Britain uh, a lot of other statues, and it's sort of seen as a do, sort of domino effect that then uh, a statue of Robert Milligan, a slave trader, was taken down in London, and you know a number of other places mm. have been reconsidering. Who, what all these statues are in their public spaces and it's and because there are a lot of them you know and it sort of it's it's shone a light on statues that have become inanimate tombstones in our mm. city spaces nice. and has activated them and has made people so so it's so a little just a little time I think it was the next day after the Colston statue was pulled down uh, people put up cardboard plaques on uh, the Edmund Burke uh, statue and said who's this guy why is he you know why is he he here he doesn't he represents these really quite um very conservative kind of values that mm. that had a detrimental effect on on bristol's urban poor and you know so so it sort of reignited the conversation so in that sense i think that's that's an active history i don't want to say good or get good or bad but it's an active history that has inspired critical reflection on our public space so there's kind of been that blindness of the every day the the um the, what, what's the phrase, they have fallen from people's eyes and now yeah. these spaces above the plinth, whether they've got something on them or not, are charged and are probably likely to remain charged for quite some time as we work our mm -hmm. way through this. So the good history that come out, comes out of this is the provocation, the opening yeah. of eyes, the awakening of a collective conversation around this. Absolutely. Yeah. And so you have things like um, uh, the Welsh government has commissioned a review into all of their public mm -hmm. monuments. Yeah. You know, and, the, and again, these are monuments that may have been put up for similar reasons during the 19th century to inspire a sense of civic pride and mm -hmm. to kind of promote a, a sense of the entrepreneurial merchant values of, the, of, you know, that they're wanting to inspire in their populations at the time. And, but have some have sat there not really doing much. Some have been long criticized. And I think there's, there is a value in reigniting a public conversation about these things. Right. Because it becomes a conversation about what do we value now? Yeah. You know, if these things don't matter, if that kind of merchant culture, you know, who is going to tell our stories? What are our stories going to be? And how are we going to tell them? And I think, you know, we've heard from both Nathan and yourself about the importance of walking trails as well, um, counter stories, different kinds of ways of um, activating and even decolonizing spaces, public spaces, um, and that there's a kind of sense of now the time has come enough yeah yeah so a provocation in these acts and, and a charged space above the plinth that will hopefully remain so and i've just had a few people coming in with comments about the fact that of course this is also happening in other parts of the world like belgium and america it's very active in america mm. and um um just Many, a lot of people, oh, somebody has asked whether you thought that the Jen Reid um, statue of um, the protest on uh, on the plinth, whether that should have stayed longer or do you think? I do, 
I, I do think it's very interesting that when they want to, the council can remove <laughs> statues from that plinth very quickly indeed, <laughs> which is which is quite telling. Although I think, in in fairness, they may have also been worried about it being mm. vandalised as well. So we because we did there was a reta so-called retaliation um, vandalism of a, a grave in yeah. Bristol. It, grave of a, an 18th century enslaved man called Scipio Africanus and that grave was smashed and uh, and there's some chalk um, writing left saying look what you made me do right. um, so I think there, there is a, there was a genuine concern that it probably would have been vandalized I I, I am quite taken by the idea of having a rotating um, plinth in Trafalgar Square and using it as somewhere to exhibit different kinds of artistic um, interventions um, in a way that speaks to kind of local context as well. Bristol's got a really great uh, culture of street art and, um, and it's really artistic, really creative place. And I think that would be um, really valuable. But I, th I think there's also value in leaving it empty for a while and sort of taking this as a moment to kind of reflect on you know, why this, why the statue stayed up so long and, mm -hmm. uh, and sort of having, having, taking a breath, I think, and, mm -hmm. and having a, a, that public conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I should imagine the Jen Reed statue, if it remains in city council care, will, will probably become part of this Edward Colston statue um, exhibition um, but there's there's also calls <laughs> yeah well <laughs> hopefully not <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> but I know the artist was also saying that if 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 it was sold then the money would go to a charity called Cargo a, a local uh, black arts charity so yeah I mean, what your comment raises for me is something that perhaps many of our Zoom um, audience are also thinking of is that, you know, for years we have been um, making requests and protests and urgent requests around climate change and been witnessing government in action. And likewise with the Colston story about requests to remove that. And, and across Australia, the same things Nathan has described of people asking for a very, very long time to remove these distressing, to change these things, and have been met with a government inertia, which has suddenly evaporated. We suddenly have these white mm. governments, which is heartening. Um, <laughs> I'm aware it's of the It's made it thinkable. Yeah, yeah. It's just that idea of it becomes a possibility, and that so sort of, when it's the thinkable, then, then it's... Yeah. A, so what's above so, the empty plinth is now a provocation. Mm. It's a reminder of what is possible. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Maybe that would be a great exercise for students as well. Is yeah. To imagine the, the empty plinth to think on that. Oh, space. yes. This will be many of my assessments for my students next year. Will be. <laughs> <laughs> great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jess. And we will return to you in the wrap up of um, our talk. And it's now time for our third and final speaker, Claire Baxter. Claire uh, completed a master's in conflict archaeology at the University of Glasgow. Her interests include um, contested heritage, memorialisation, civilian experience of warfare and prisoners of war. And she came to my attention recently because of a terrific piece she posted on the idea of viewing, viewing statues not as history, not as memory work, but as actually as archaeological artefacts or to see them through the lens. So I think Claire's going to give us some really interesting answers about what you can do with statues. Tear them down, crumble them up and turn them into different installation pieces or something completely different. Over to you, Claire. Thank you. Um, so before I start, I just want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you Tonight from the land of the Boon Warren people um, in inner South East Melbourne. Um, so as Kira mentioned, um, I completed my master's last year in conflict archaeology and heritage at the University of Glasgow. Um, and for our research dissertations, we had the choice of either subject. So we could choose archaeology or we could choose heritage. Um, and I decided to pick what I thought was going to be a heritage project because um, it seemed practically a little bit simpler um, in the time that we had available. Um, you know, it's obviously a lot easier to visit a museum and, and have a look at some heritage than it is to excavate a site, which obviously I also didn't have the budget to do. Um, so I set out to look at the current debates around statues, particularly with regard to the discussion about context. And I, um, 
then compare that to what was done at the Soviet statue parks in Eastern Europe and see what we might be able to learn from what they did there. But actually the further I got into the project, the more I began to see the issue as one of archeology span after all. So kind of um, thought I was doing a heritage project and ended up doing um, an archeology span project. So not only is archeology span not the study of dinosaurs, which is a common misconception, um, it's the study of human activity, beliefs and values through material culture. And material culture is the physical objects that were created and used by humans. So many people are familiar with archaeology of ancient societies um, such as you know, Rome or Greece or Egypt, but it can also relate to the more recent historical period and right up until the current day. So really anywhere and any time period that there were humans who used objects, and that includes us. So when I hear in the current debates about statues, and a couple of um, speakers have already mentioned it, arguments about you know, tearing them down erases our history or on the other side, um, we don't need statues to teach the history of colonialism. I think that this notion of statues as history is confusing. Um, the fact is that statues in the current form teach us very little about history. Most of them just have a small plaque um, with the, you know, the, the name of the person, um, maybe their job or their major achievement who raised funds for it, the year it was installed, or yeah, you know, things like that. Um, so the majority of Captain Cook statues, for example, don't talk about who appointed him, when he set sail, what difficulties he encountered on a journey, um, the methods he used to chart the co coast, what happened when he arrived, that sort of thing. And so there's just a, a simple description, um, like the one on the um, uh, the statue in Hyde Park in Sydney, which. Um, has already come up tonight, just saying that he discovered this territory. Um, so not only does that not teach us anything about history, it's also kind of a raising history um, because A, it's not true, and B, it only represents a very Europeanized version of the story. But having these memorials and only these memorials normalizes that kind of that version of history and it perpetuates a kind of founding myth um, and excludes other versions of um, the story. So by seeing these statues as archaeology instead of history, although it is partly semantics, it changes the view from being one about the individual being memorialised and instead focuses on what they tell us of the societies that created the statues, um, erected them, and then perhaps altered, removed and replaced them. So statues are therefore a story about us who we celebrated, what histories we told, what values we upheld, and who held the power in our societies. And at present, our memorial landscapes are largely white men. So for example, um, I walked this stretch of, um, excuse my fairly rudimentary map there, um, walked this two kilometer stretch of road, which is a, kind of the main pedestrian thoroughfare um, through the center of Melbourne from the King's Domain Park up to the State Library. Um, and I looked at all the memorials that you can see along that route from the road. Uh, there are 14, 13 of them are men. The only woman is Joan of Arc, who is positioned outside the State Library. And she's flanked by a bunyip, St George fighting the dragon, and a gum nut baby. So kind of a reflection of the stories inside the library rather than you know, an actual memorials. And then all of the other statues of named individuals along that route are of men, and all of them, with the possible exception of St George, are white men. Um, so if we think of these as the archaeological record of our society, do you think it's reflective of who we are and who we look up to? And if people of the future were looking back at us and interpreting us through this record, what is it communicating about us, about who was celebrated and who had power? And is it what we want our record to say? So we often hear, um, and these are, the, these are some of the men that you can see along the road there as well. We often hear talk about context in the debate about statues. For example, they're reflective of their time, time being a kind of context, or the suggestion that we leave them where we are, but we add additional context, or we move them to a museum where they can be contextualized. So context is also an important part of archaeology, and that was what formed the basis for my research. 
are proposed for different types of contexts, so the biographical context of the person or event being depicted, the historical context in which the statue was proposed, created and erected, changed social context in which we're viewing them now, and then the physical context of where it was actually located. So as archaeologists, we know that if you remove an object from its location, it changes the meaning of the object. The objects don't have intrinsic meaning. Um, as Jess mentioned, you know, they're, they're lumps of stone or metal. Um, we give them meaning through their use, their surroundings, and their relationship to other objects in the landscape. So a statue's location can alter its meaning. And if you have a look at these two statues of um, Shane Warne on the left and Keith Miller on the right, both are well-known Australian and Victorian cricket players. Um, both somewhat flawed men with a history of infidelity, um, but both statues are located at the MCG, so a famous cricket ground. They're surrounded by statues of other men and women who performed great sporting feats at that ground, all of whom are in action poses um, similar to these two. So in this physical context with their relationship to other objects, it's fairly clear what they're being celebrated for. So the context is sporting achievement, not for being wonderful, flawless humans. Whereas if the same statues were on their own, on the steps of the State Parliament building, for example, they would have a different meaning. It would perhaps be a little bit strange. So this one, this statue is in the Hungarian statue park, Memento Park in Budapest. And it's of a man named, I'm going to get this wrong, so I'm sorry for my pronunciation, um, Endres Sogvari. Um, so he was a hero during World War II fighting in the resistance against the Nazis. But then he was also a member of the Communist Party. So in terms of like public um, popularity, he had a bit of a dual personality. So do you keep that statue or do you not? Um, and that was apparently an issue that was much debated in Hungary at the time. Uh, well, at the time that they were all being removed. But in the end, the decision was made to remove it because it was put up as communist propaganda, not, it wasn't put up as part of the fight, like to recognize the fight against Nazism. So again, uh, the importance of understanding context. So we deal with um, archeological artifacts in a lot of different ways. So they might be uncovered, recorded in place and then covered over again. Um, they might be left in place uncovered with some kind of protection and interpretation, or they might be recorded, removed and placed in a museum or research collection, or a new museum might be um, created specifically for them. So there are examples of all these approaches with regard to statues as well. So this plaque is on the Maitland Brown Memorial in Fremantle, um, which is a statue that's been left in place, but it's had this additional information added, um, which if you can't see it, if you're on a small screen, it says, this plaque was erected by people who found the monument before you offensive. The monument describes the events at LaGrange from one perspective only, the viewpoint of the white settlers. No mention is made of the right of Aboriginal people to defend their land or of the history of provocation which led to the explorers' deaths. The punitive party mentioned here ended in the deaths of somewhere around 20 Aboriginal people. The whites were well armed and equipped and none of their party was killed or wounded. This plaque is in memory of the Aboriginal people killed at LaGrange it also commemorates all other Aboriginal people who died during the invasion of their country. So that's one example of where additional context has been added um, to an existing statue. Another example, um, which again is a little bit like um, what Jess was suggesting for the Colston statue in Bristol, um, a Jefferson Davis statue at the University of Texas in Austin was removed um, from the campus into the campus's museum and it's got additional detail about why it was created, why it was removed, um, copies of um, some of the documents from like the university council proposing the statue um, and then some images of it coming down as well. And then of course there's the statue parks in Eastern Europe in Hungary and Lithuania and Russia, which were purpose built to house their unwanted statues. So whichever option is taken, recording the objects is a common theme throughout each um, form of archaeological treatment. And the purpose of recording is to preserve the context. So we already have the historical context through documents, um, so both the biographical detail and in many cases things like council records. 
about the creation of the statue and who proposed it, authorised it and paid for it. So what we need to record now is the physical context um, before the statues get removed and altered, which can be done by photography or mapping or laser scanning, um, photogrammetry, um, various other techniques. And what's important is not just the statue and its location, but it's also its relationship to other statues and locations. So for example, as I mentioned along St Kilda Road, the fact of there being 12 monuments to white males, if I'm excluding St George, um, and only one female on that two kilometre stretch of road tells us more about our society than any single one of those monuments on its own. And then if the choice of what monuments get erected is a reflection of our society, then so is the choice of which ones get preserved, vandalised and torn down. And this is another form of context which we should also be recording. Um, and oral history would be a good way to approach that. So um, specifically from a multivocal point of view. So how did different people feel in the space around the statue? Why has it now become controversial? What change did it go through? For example, vandalism and protest. And what groups were involved in the decision to retain or remove it? So I propose that by thinking of these objects as an archeological record rather than just historical objects, it kind of allows for a, a more nuanced discussion about their purpose. And if we see them as a current reflection of our social values, it feels like they are come kind of out of date um, and that there is room to even up the score a little bit. So again, talking about context, a Captain Cook statue at Botany Bay might be appropriate in its context because it's an historical marker, um, but it could also be accompanied by an art piece commemorating the victims of colonialism from those who died on convict transports, who faced rape and violence on arrival, and then the native or in, um, Aboriginal people who died from violence or disease and had their culture and way of life disrupted. And that would give a fuller picture and change the way in which we think about that event. Um, we should also put some time into recording the objects so that they can be studied and questioned in future and provide an insight into the archeological record of who created the statues. And that would enable us to use the objects to their best educational advantage and to encourage critical thinking about the way in which we present history, what versions get told, and to reflect on who we are celebrating and whose voices we are valuing. Thanks. Uh, a question from the President of the History Council, which is asking whether or not the act of putting these statues in museums might actually be undermining the attempt to decolonise space, that it's just sort of moving them off, diffusing them, but it's kind of still venerating them and giving them some special place. Yeah, so um, looking at the, the statue parks in Eastern Europe, um, none of them really did a very good job of that. Um, there's pretty, yeah, varying um, interpretation that accompanies them. And I, I think that it really kind of depends. So I think the, the one in Texas, which I haven't actually seen personally, um, but it, it is kind of, um, and again, um, talking just a suggestion of moving the Colston statue into the, that museum in Bristol as well. I think that could still achieve the aim of um, decolonizing the um, uh, the museum and the space a little bit because you're you're talking about the issues associated with the statue. You're not just moving it um, and, and moving a statue into a museum. It's kind of on its own if, it, if that's not done well can, you know, it can almost make it worse in a way because you're putting a, an object, you know, a large object into a relatively small room. So it might make it actually look even bigger than it mm. was, take up more space than it, than it did. Um, and it's expensive. The only benefit I would see of some of those statue parks is how absurd they all look when they're sort of standing around facing each other. You know, it really does heighten the absurdity of that kind of great white man hero history. And it does seem to me that there's potentially a place for much more humour and comedy, irony, satire, parody in this. Yeah, and that's, yeah, I guess that's a, a bit of a double-edged sword in a way. Um, that it's been one of the main criticisms of those parks is that they do come across as ironic. Mm -hmm. um, 
and you know there, there's pictures everywhere of you know people posing with the statues um got one of um lennon with a lipstick mark on his forehead um and i guess yeah you've kind of like that's one angle but on the other hand someone like stalin isn't really funny um so is that is that what you want to present um so i think you have to be really really clear with your aim and presenting that content can help set the tone as yeah. well but maybe again you know inviting students to think about how they might um, respond to these statues if they were on face-to-face -face level could be an interesting educative experience too i noticed in ballarat at the um in the they have a parade where they have all the previous prime ministers that someone had put a wreath of um, onions around Tony Abbott's head, which I thought it was a, a fairly effective political statement um, that was using humour. And uh, I just wonder if there's a role in sort of debunking the power of that kind of history as well. Yeah, look, I, I think, like, um, yeah, I guess that's my preferred um, option rather than like spray painting graffiti is humour. I think like the um, the cover image for the presentation tonight with with the red hands, I think that says a lot more than you're know, just spray painting some words on. But yeah, I think, you know, there, there's definitely a place for humour. There was another statue in Lithuania of Lenin with his arm outstretched and a woman used to come every single day and hang a basket of rotten produce off his hand. Um, to you know, communicate what collective farming was doing and, and what kind of waste it was um, creating, and it's non-destructive, but it's still sending a really clear um, message and protest. And in the end, they actually removed that statue and replaced it with a streamlined version of Lenin without his arm outstretched, so you couldn't hang anything off it anymore. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I think humor is is perhaps more effective um, in, in getting that message across sometimes. I think people can maybe relate to that a little bit more. I mean, there's two things that come up for me in there is one is that they remain still largely invisible and silent, but incredibly effective in maintaining the status quo. And, and also, you know, as Nathan reminded us um, earlier, that in all of this discussion as we're preoccupied with statue wars we are perhaps missing the main game which is the destruction of real history 46,000 years old land sacred sites you know the places that really need to be preserved and that perhaps our role as historians or people who um, are deeply invested in the past is needs to be to put our eyes and our attention and our energies back on that game um, I feel like I just handed that over to you, Nathan. Is that, do you want to comment on that? You're, unmute yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, yeah, um, yeah, that's that's what I said before. And I think similar, I also think, um, and this might be a little bit off topic, but I think, again, to what uh, Jessica and I were saying too, I think there is also a discussion about what's happening now outside of the statues and how... Uh, I do really think um, it is good to yeah focus on sacred sites and to really think about uh, their role because that's um, a lot of those sites like a place like Lake Mungo for example, which is being uh, preserved, is not just a site of like Australian history; it's a site of like world history with you know some of the oldest footprints and the Pilbara also having some of the oldest um, casts of face, uh, and uh, I think it was a site where the oldest stone axe has been found i'm um, pretty sure that's the case so i think um yeah there is importance to you know think about what is heritage but yeah and also to with this discussion to um uh because it was reignited by the black lives movement i like to always sort of you know uh, again with context is that's the context that sort of sparked this debate so we should um make sure we're always um considering that when we talk about this Absolutely, keep that firmly in our in our context. Um, and, and Claire, one of um, our comments from the audience has been a thank you to remind us that your presentation has brought to our attention the element of propaganda in so many public statues as well, and that um, 
removing the statues might be pushing away from propaganda, but it might also be, again, locking us in one sort of conversation when there are other more important conversations and contexts to have. Yeah, as I saw another question in there as well about whether people actually notice them at all. Mm-hmm. And um, I do kind of agree with that. Like, you know, I, that stretch of road that I highlighted, um, I've walked that every day to, mm-hmm. to and from work before we got locked down, obviously, and couldn't go to work anymore. Um, and I couldn't have told you who half those people were. Um, but to the same extent, I do think it is, it is, you know, having a statue of Captain Cook, for example, in, in Fitzroy in Melbourne, he never even came to Melbourne. Like, so I, I do think that there is a little bit of propaganda and, and like I said, that kind of founding myth um, that we're trying to, like, create that shared history that, and, yeah, I, so I do think that there is that element there. And then as Nathan said, like, for some people, it is genuinely uncomfortable. So well, I might not notice it. Um, for somebody else, it is uncomfortable and therefore it is worthy of at least having that discussion. Yeah, I think one of the things that shifts across this conversation and this debate in the issue is precisely who is the we in this conversation. And that uh, what we're talking about is wanting to radically um, is to further the expansion of what public history is by attending to um, a greater appreciation of who we is, that we has not been acceptable. It is no longer acceptable to us because it does marginalise, silence, upset, distress, not represent um, sufficient people. And that history itself might have moved on to be very aware of those issues or increasingly aware, but our statues haven't kept up with us. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I think there's also something useful about uh, just coming back to teaching that there's something that's quite transferable and understandable about the about propaganda and I think actually you know a lot of uh, young people in school will learn about propaganda particularly in Britain in the second world war probably similar in Australia and there's a sort of sense in which that's a concept that you can kind of get your head around quite easily and so I think there's there's a useful conversation to be had there and just on your point about the question about we is a question of power as well. And um, I know, uh, Clay, you already picked up on this or answered this question as well, but there was a question a bit further back about whether putting sta- the statues in a museum is appropriate, given that that is a colonial context. And I just think that's a really interesting question. And I think there's a lot to be said about things like the things that Nathan's doing around decolonial practice, and that if you are going to do that, it needs to be done in you know, a really well thought through way in a way that adopts a decolonial practice uh, through that and relinquishes power, that sort of spreads the power to people who have not had it in in that situation. And also that museums also have their own contexts and histories. So, for example, I don't think we should even con- countenance the idea of, of putting the Edward Colston statue in the Bristol City Museum and Art Gallery, because that has a, a very problematic colonial history and was paid for by the Wills family who made their money in tobacco and so there's a kind of it would be inappropriate for that that site to be used but the social history museum I think has some more flexibility in the processes there but I just I just wanted to flag that as a really important point because I think there's probably a lot of us that here in this conversation that work in museums or with museums and I think that's that's a sort of key key point so thank you for the question yeah thank you well, I'd like, I'd like to wrap up now just by um, throwing over to our audience as well as our speakers three um, suggested approaches that Tyler Steam offered in his um, 2018 Guardian article, which I suggest people look at if they're still interested in this topic. And he suggested that there were three key ways that we could think about how we might respond to statues. A conservative uh, response, which is obviously leave them as they are, what's your problem? <laughs> um, and agonism, a response that was agonistic, which um, sought to, it's spelt um, Tyler, S-T-E-I-M, so M for Mary, um, and T-Y-L-E-R. And the agonism, a- agonistic re- response, which is to put the plaques, the plaques, the contextualise, further the conversation, but to allow some sort of historical process to continue that is in the genre 
that was established by erecting that statue in quite a 19th century genre of public history telling. And the third one is the antagonistic one, which is to remove either violently through protest or through um, com- through collaboration with the council. So I would invite you to think about where you might sit in that, where you might like to situate yourself, but also if you think there's something better, there's a better response. I want to finish tonight before I thank everybody to ask three of our speakers to just quickly respond to the theme of this year's History Week, which is in September, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. This year, our um, theme seems to be remarkably appropriate. It is history, what is it good for? So I'm going to throw it open. Uh, I'm going to go in back to front order. I'm going to start with you, Claire. <laughs> what have you got? What What is history good for? Given that you're not a, you're not a trained historian necessarily. I think... I think, you know, we've still got a lot to learn from history. So, um, you know, we spoke before the discussion tonight about um, like Spanish flu historians this year. And while this pandemic might be different, the virus itself might be different, but there's still, there's still really key learnings from that. Um, Like I read something the other day that said that one of the, one of the things that historians took away from that is the fact that, before measures are put in place, everybody thinks that the, um, oh, oh, as measures start to be put in place, everyone thinks that the government is doing too much, acting too harshly. And then as it progresses, everyone's going to accuse the government of not doing enough. And we're seeing that in Victoria at the moment. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's just common threads. Um, and yeah, I, I still think that there's really a lot that we can we can still be learning. Yeah, right. Thank you, Jess. History. What is it good for? <laughs> um, I hope no one says absolutely nothing just because <laughs> they're tempted to from that yeah, presentation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, I just thought, uh, similarly, I, I came to history late as well. I was, I, I'm actually an archaeologist in a in a far, former life. Um, my PhD was my first. Uh, historical uh, journey <laughs> I suppose but I, I think um, I mean I, I agree with Claire and I think I'd also say that history is good for understanding and I think that's the point where the thing that I keep coming back to is that understanding historical processes is really important and I think it can be really important because it destabilizes mythologies it destabilizes assumptions that have been embedded into our into our uh, statues and monuments and public discourse uh, it destabilizes the idea of you know a heritage of a place being a certain thing and so I do think that good historical research and and study and and knowing the past and understanding the past is a way to critically engage with um, narratives that have been imposed on us as so-called common sense or just the way it is and they can be a way therefore of reclaiming power in those narratives as well. Excellent thank you and Nathan you get the final word history what is it good for? I I think I'm just going to parrot Jessica and Claire and just sort of say that Understanding the understanding history is good to understand the present. Like I think that a lot of things that we are facing are sort of historically embedded, and I think if we can sort of see, especially to in terms of sort of things like racial justice, I always think it's good to see previously because I think we have an assumption that uh, racial progress is very linear. That um, you know, as we as time goes on, we get more racially progressive. We get pro- more progressive. Yeah. When, if you look at history, it's usually the types of forms of things of like racial and uh, sexual oppression just sort of morph a little bit. Um, so I think it's it's a good way to sort of think of how it's worked and how it's potentially, in some cases, has been min- like weakened in some cases. But also, what, um, thinking about what we need to fight, like what do we need to, what do we need to fight, and um, and again, like I think it is a, it is a way to sort of uh, looking at history as a way to identify power. I think as well to sort of um, then to challenge it. I think is uh, I think you need that identification of power, that naming of the um, powers to sort of um, if they need to be challenged to do so. Yeah, 
I'm just having an empty Prince moment on that one because I think you you've really reminded us about language and um, you know all three of our speakers have just been fantastic. So thank you very much to everybody and to our staff at the History Council who um, are working tirelessly behind the scenes, Catherine Shirley and Cassandra Rogers. Thank you very much for all you've done. We need to finish by saying a very true and heartfelt thanks for fantastic um, time and contribution of our speakers. So thank you very much, everybody. Mm -hmm.